turn your Bibles, please, to the book of Psalms. Psalms, we're going to do maybe a little bit of a non-typical message this morning. Look at things very practically. Hit a few passages in Psalms and Proverbs. about how you should live your day-to-day -day life. Psalm 127. The Bible says this is a song of degrees for Solomon. Verse 1, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Isn't that interesting that the Lord calls the food you eat based on the feeling you have while you're eating it? Isn't that interesting? For example, in Proverbs 31, 31, when it talks about the virtuous woman, you know what it says about her? It says, she eateth not the bread of idleness. You know what the bread of idleness is? That's when you're just sitting around and don't have anything else to do. And so you just eat. <laughs> I've done that. I've got fat that way before. Before I had my swallowing problem, I ate as much bread of idleness as anybody you know. <laughs> I remember when I got about 10 years old and I was growing and got wanting to eat a little bit more and it got even worse when I was 11 and 12 and 13 and through there. If uh, summer break or something, I didn't really have a yard to mow and didn't really have anything going on. I was just sitting around. Next thing I knew, I was in the kitchen opening the cabinets or the refrigerator just looking for something to eat. Oh yeah, and Mom, the wise as she was, would say, Bob, you're just sitting around bored and just eating just because you're bored. Go out and do something. <laughs> You know what I was doing? I was eating the bread of idleness. It is not good for you to eat the bread of idleness. Amen. The virtuous woman does not eat the bread of idleness. There's stuff that can be done. Now here, though, um, it says to eat the bread of sorrows. You know what the bread of sorrows is? That's when you're depressed, and so you eat something to comfort you. Do we not have a term called comfort food? Oh, yes. yes. I'll tell you what mine is. <laughs> chocolate and peanut butter ice cream. <laughs> and in the fall, I like to put a little salt and a little caramel on it. Salted caramel in the fall. Now, that is my go-to fall comfort food. Love it. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. You have a great upbringing if you have no shame and you have no fear. Now that's a young man. That's a young woman. That's a young person. They don't have anything to be ashamed of. And they don't have anything to be afraid of. We live in a day where some people are putting some stuff on social media and on the internet that two or three years from now and definitely five to ten years from now, they're going to be ashamed of. Absolutely. <laughs> Amen. And there's some people putting it on old-fashioned cards and letters and putting it on phones and putting it in chat rooms that sometimes just a few weeks from now they're going to be ashamed of. And definitely a few months from now and a couple years from now they're going to be ashamed of. You know what you should do? You should live in such a way that you don't have shame. Look, shall not be ashamed and shall speak with the enemies in the gate. You can look your enemy right in the face and have no fear because you know you're doing your best to do what's right. Didn't mean that you're perfect. But you don't have to live in shame or fear when you're living in the center of God's will and you have some human frailty. You know what? We all have that. 
So I want to preach today a, a very practical message, what to fill your days with. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray your spirit come down and bear witness to the truth of this, Lord. You know how you stirred my heart with it yesterday. And God, I pray that we had learned these lessons and I pray that we'd live up to them. God, I pray I'd live up to them better than I do. And Lord, we're looking forward to your coming and we dread the direction that the world is going. And it's going the wrong way. But thank God it just shows us signs that we can lift up our heads for our redemption draweth nigh. But until then, I pray, dear God, that we'd fill our days with the practical advice that you give us in the wisdom books like Psalms and Proverbs. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right, now the Bible says here in Psalm 127, verse 1, it says, Except the Lord build the house. Now, because I had seven children, I got real concerned with the family and reading ministry to family stuff. And after a while, I get a little sick of it. <laughs> and I began to call them the family, family, family. I mean, every word out of their mouth was, what's best for your family? And every single word was family, family, family. And exactly the role the man should play and the woman should play and the children should play. And they just talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Don't get me wrong, the Bible talks about that. That's important. But there are some people, bless their hearts, that is all they ever talk about all day long. And you know what I've noticed? They don't live up to it. Amen. Any better than the ones that barely ever talk about it. Now, don't get me wrong. It's something we need to study. It is an important part of God's Word. It's an important part of what I'm about to be preaching on as to how you should fill your days. But don't think because somebody just talks about something all the time that they actually do it. There's a lot of people that talk about believing this King James Bible and they don't know it like they think they do. I know it. And they don't live it like they think they do. And I've been one of that number sometimes. There's people that talk about prayer and they don't pray all that much. There's people that talk about soul winning and they don't witness all that much. There's people that talk about preaching and they don't show up for it very much. There's people that talk about a lot of stuff they don't live up to. Let me tell you about building your house. You don't need to go to another seminar you don't need to read another book if you've already read something. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't study. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a work that needs not to be ashamed, rightly abiding the word of truth. I believe all that stuff. But sometimes you've read about 27 books on it. It's about time you start doing some of it. Yeah. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. You know what you're going to need? You're going to need the Lord. Yeah. You're going to need God to step in. I remember hearing and reading after Bob Jones Sr., the great founder of Bob Jones University from generations ago at this point. I remember one time he was real burdened and preaching, and he said, you mothers and you fathers, think about you having that kind of an influence on the soul of a little child and not praying. How can you do that and not pray? Listen, we need to pray. <coughs> The old, the old uh, spiritual song that I've heard uh, sung here in the country says, um, When Father would pray, Lord save my dear children, it seemed that sweet heaven was there. I'd like to go back when my days are over and hear my name spoken in prayer. When Father would pray, Lord save my dear children, it seemed that sweet heaven was there. That's an important thing. More important than reading another book on it and listening to another podcast on it and pulling up another thing on social media about it and saying a little thing that'll give your you know make your heart feel good for a little while, but won't last, is getting a hold of God and reading what the Word of God says about it and taking some actions according to what God says to do. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. You know you can tear it down. The Bible says every wise woman buildeth her house. But the foolish teareth it down with her hands. I know you love your family. I know you do. But some good Christians and some well-meaning people can tear down their house. They sure do. Um, he that troubleth his house shall inherit the wind. He, men can do it. Wise woman buildeth her house, but the foolish teareth it down with her hands. Women can do it. You know what you do? You know how you mess up your house? You get it off the trail of God's plan. Because who is it that has to build your house? Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Oh, Brother Schoolfield, you don't know how I love my kids. 
Oh, Brother Schofield, you don't know how I love my wife. Oh, Brother, oh, I work hard. Oh, I keep this house beautiful. Oh, I earn real good money. Oh, I love my kids and they know it. And I correct them when they need it. Except the Lord build the house. They labor in vain that build it. Now, you are working. You should work hard around your house. That's a good thing. But we don't want your labor to be in vain. You know who we need building our house? The Lord. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh, but in vain. Oh, this is an election year. I gotta vote for the conservative. I gotta take care of the I don't care who you elect. If the Lord doesn't keep your city, it's going in vain. Absolutely. Safety is of the Lord. Horses are a vain thing. Safety comes from the Lord. And you can add jets and tanks and the coolest, latest electronic weapons, and you gotta admit, they got some cool electronic weapons these days. They can literally, we used to joke in years gone by about, well, it's not like you can get somebody's address and mail a missile to their address. <laughs> Did you know you can now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can absolutely put an address in there and make a missile hit that thing. Oh, yes. They got some weapons these days, man. Man, hey, listen, you want to be impressed by something? Just see how good men are at killing each other. <laughs> I mean, they're good at it. It's unbelievable. Have you seen what some of these gunships will do? Put a bullet on about every square inch for I don't know how many square feet. Oh, okay. I mean, it's unbelievable. They can take you out. You know who's going to have to protect you from that? You can get you a shield that will protect you from a gunship or a or an electronic weapon that can literally send a missile to your house with GPS. I remember back in about 1992, a guy came into work where I was working at Lowe's there in the lumber area. And a guy came in, he said, Bob, this is something my son, he's in the army, and this is something my son has brought me, and it's called a GPS, Global Positioning System, I think it was. And he was showing me that, and I was amazed at it. Now we've all got it in our phones, in our pockets. Is that not amazing? <laughs> I've never heard of any such a thing. Buddy, they can do it. You know what you're going to need? I mean, we needed it before, but nowadays, I sure hope you realize you need the Lord to build your house. You need the Lord to protect your city. You need the Lord to keep you and your family safe. And if you're setting up worried sick about it, you're wasting your time. Amen. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late worrying about it. How many wakes up about 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning worried about stuff sometimes going on with your family? He sure has. He's got me, buddy. I, I head right in there and read my Bible. I send up some prayers. Because when those things happen, I'm going to the one that can help them. Because if I could help them, I wouldn't be up at 3 o'clock in the morning worried about it. I'd have done helped it. Verse 3, low children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. Who gave you those children? God Almighty. Amen. You know what you should do? You should act accordingly. Yeah. Number one, do what's right. But sometimes God's people, they've sat in church all their lives, they've heard the Bible taught and preached, they know what they should do, they're right. They can show you how what they're doing is completely legal and within all the laws. They can show you how what they're doing is in, a, in obedience with this old King James Bible that we believe. Praise God for it. But as the Lord had to tell his disciples, you can be right with the wrong spirit. And sometimes your spirit shows more at home than how right you are. You remember when... Uh, <coughs> the inner circle said to the Lord about those Samaritans, Lord, should we call down fire like Elijah did? You know what? They were right. Elijah did call down fire. By the power of God, the Lord was in it. You know what's going to happen in the book of Revelation? Elijah's going to show up again. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to call down fire. Amen. They were right in the Old Testament. They're right in the apocalyptic future. You know what the Lord Jesus said? He didn't say, well, now you are right there from that Old Testament passage and from that what's going to happen in the apocalypse. Now you're right there. You know what he said? He said, ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. 
You can do right with the wrong spirit, and sometimes that'll affect your family more than whether or not you get some of the details wrong. I wish I'd have understood that as a much younger man. Verse 4, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. This isn't about proving how right you are. This is pr about how to be happy. Different subject. There are some people that are right and they are miserable. I'm not talking to you about right. I'm talking to you about happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed. As I already said as we read the text, they don't have to be ashamed. The righteous are bold as a lion. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. And this, you know when you're not ashamed? When you've got the power. And they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. You know when you're not afraid? When you've got the power. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You have no apologies. You know what they said about the Lord Jesus? They said they were astonished at his doctrine, not because he you know, thought up some real cool things to say, but because he taught with them with authority and not as the scribes. You know what they said about Peter and, and John in the book of Acts? It said they... Because they were bold, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned men, they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You know what that does? That gives you some power. So you don't have to be ashamed and you don't have to be afraid. That's Psalm 127. Now look down at Psalm 128, the very next chapter. These are very short psalms. Look at the first word of Psalm 128. Blessed. Blessed. That is real close to our word happy. So in chapter 127, we see that we do not need to worry. In our day-to-day -day life, if we're relying on the Lord to build the house, we're not laboring in vain. We don't have to rise up early and sit up late. We just have to realize children are in heritage of the Lord. And happy is the man that hath his quiver full. No worry in Psalm 127. Now let's look at Psalm 128. And notice how it emphasizes work. Blessed. What did it just say in verse 5? Happy. What is blessed synonymous with? Happy. Blessed is every one that feareth the Lord that walketh in his ways. Who's first here? Chapter 128 verse 1 is the same as... 127 verse 1, the Lord is first. You say, well, you're in church, so of course you're going to say the Lord is first. Ah, oh, but yes, if we'd actually get a hold of that and not just repeat it as a, almost a catechism. <laughs> yeah, put Jesus first, Jesus and others in you. What a wonderful way to spell joy. No, that's real. If you actually live that, it'll change your life. At the beginning of chapter 127 is the Lord. At the beginning of 128 is the Lord. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord, that walketh in his ways. You know what the first thing you need to do every morning is spend time with the Lord. You know what the first thing you need to do at the beginning of the week is spend time with the Lord. Amen. You know what the first thing you need to do when you do your budget? Take care of the Lord and his work. You know what the first thing you need to do every uh, year is think about the Lord. First hour when you wake up, think of the Lord. Give him the first fruits. How do you do that? Number one, make sure you've trusted him as your Savior. If you're not saved, you're not in a relationship with him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. Number one, make sure you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Number two, Build a relationship with him. Amen. You know how you do that? You spend time with him. You talk to him. You don't have a relationship with somebody you don't spend time with. Amen. Talk to him. You open your Bible every morning and as you read, even if it's just two or three chapters, short chapters like this, or even if it's just one regular sized chapter, spend some time with him. You know what's happening? He's talking to you. Amen. And then you pray, or pray first and then read. I don't care. 
But pray and read your Bible both. You know what's happening then? You're talking to him. You know what happens when you're talking to somebody and they're talking to you and you do it every day? You're building a relationship. You know what happens if you don't talk to them and they don't talk to you? You are losing your relationship. How should you feel every day? Number one, put the Lord first. Verse two, Psalm 128. For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands, happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. Verse 5 of the previous chapter is happy. Verse 1 of this chapter is blessed. Verse 2 is happy. At the end of the verse, well. Do you want to be happy, blessed, happy, and well? Yes. Fill yeah. your days with what we're talking about right here. Number one is the Lord. What's number two? Your labor. God has something for you to do. God has a job for you to fulfill. God has a business for you to start. God has a ministry for you to start. God has some things you need to take care of, and we'll get to that here in a minute when we get over in Proverbs. Be busy in the work that God has given you to do. You know what the Lord Jesus said? He said, I must do his works. You know what he said? He said, I'll do always those things that please him. You know what Bob Jones Sr. said? The definition of success is find what God would have you do and do it. There's some things I know God would have you do. I know he'd have you read your Bible. That's how he talks to you. I know he'd have you pray. That's how you talk back to him. I know he'd have you have a good testimony and love your family and some of those things. Get busy doing those and he'll show you the next thing. And he'll show you the next thing. Where God opens the door, you go through it. You work for him. Number one, you take care of the Lord. Number two, you take care of your labor. You say, oh, I don't like working. That's what God made you to do. Even before sin, even before the fall. You know what Adam had to do? He had to dress the garden and keep it, didn't he? It was probably a lot easier back then. Because <laughs> later, you know, he got the thorns and the thistles and everything. But he had a job to do. Amen. We have a problem with shirking responsibility. Yes, we do. Go find something to do and do it. And if your heart is sincere and you start a little bit down the wrong path, the Lord will correct you. As we often quote when we talk about these things, I being in the way, the Lord led me. But you will never get started sitting in the reclining chair. You'll never get started laying on the couch, and I love laying on the couch like few people you've ever met. <laughs> but you will never get started unless you get up and start going. I don't know how many times I did not want to go to a special meeting. I finally had an evening off, and I did not want to go hear some preacher other than at my church. And I got up and went, and I was always glad I did. Yeah. Because yeah. the Lord had a message for me. And it's the same way with work and everything else. I went and took a job, and I wasn't that crazy about it, but it led to an opportunity, which led to an opportunity, which led to an opportunity, and the Lord opened another door, which opened another door, which opened another door. Number one, take care of the Lord. Number two, take care of your labor, and you have words like happy, blessed, happy, well. Verse 3 of Psalm 128. Thy wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of thine house. Thy children, like olive plants, round about thy table. Verse 1, take care of the Lord. Verse 2, take care of your labor. Then you know what you're ready for? You're ready for your loves. There's your wife. There's your children. You know what's wrong in a lot of our families? We got a lot of people that aren't ready for their loves. The Lord is nowhere in their lives. And their labor... <laughs> Leaves quite a bit to be desired. Listen, you pour your heart into the Lord. You pour your heart into your labor. And you know what happens? Happy, blessed, happy, well, wife, children, family, all those wonderful things. They happen. There's your loves. But first lay the foundation for your loves. Now the Lord, knowing that he wanted these things to happen, puts within us some desires that go along these lines, didn't he? Oh, yeah. You know how to 
mess things up. Start looking for your loves before you've established your labor. You know what will mess things up? Start looking for your labor and your money making before you've put the Lord first. Don't you get out there and find your love because of some urge or get your labor going because you really want a lot of money and then afterwards say, oh, I kind of need the Lord here. Let me add him to my repertoire. No. The Lord comes first. And don't you try when you haven't poured your heart into your labor to start getting into your loves. The Lord has a good order here. The Lord, your labor, and your loves. There, you can do it right. Because now, you can show the wife the man that you're supposed to be. <coughs> so many people are so disappointed because they can see, and I'm, I'm addressing this mainly to young men now, but it's true for old men, it's true for ladies, it's true for everybody. But they can see the potential in somebody and the person they could be, and they're not doing it. And there's usually one of two things missing. Either they're not where they need to be with the Lord, or they're not pouring their heart into their labor. I didn't say pouring in 24 hours a day into their labor. You need to rest, don't you? You need to rest every night, and you need to rest a day or so a week, don't you? Amen. Have you ever tried to burn the candle at both ends and work uh, 18 hours a day for seven days a week? You can do that for a while. <laughs> there comes a point you give out. Don't ask me how I know. There comes a point you can't keep all those things being juggled at the same time. But I did say you get the Lord and you get the labor and then you get your loves. Verse 4, Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. Ah, you know why you labor like you should? Because you realize God's watching. Most people don't. You know what most people are worried about? They're worried about if the drill instructor is watching me. They're worried about if the boss is seeing me. They're worried about if the teacher or the principal is seeing me. They're worried about if the preacher heard me. I've told you before, sometimes people find out I'm a Christian and they'll say, Oh, sorry, Bob, I didn't mean to say that word in front of you. And I have that response, you know, that I always give. Well, don't worry about me. Worry about that one that always hears you. Amen. You know what will keep you focused on your labor correctly? When you realize the Lord Jesus Christ is your boss. And he's seeing everything you do or don't do and say or don't say. Behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. And you know what else? The way you treat your wife and the way you treat your children, you need to keep in mind what God is saying. There's a lot of people do their wife and their children wrong or do their husband and their children wrong, whatever the case may be, and they forget that God is seeing it. Well, you don't know what they said to me. They deserve it anyway. That won't work with the Lord. Because when it comes time to give account to the Lord, guess what? He's going to have you give account for yourself, not for what they did. He'll take care of them. Don't get me wrong. Their time's coming, too. <laughs> They're going to give account for theirs, but you've got to give account for yours. <coughs> And tit for tat won't work on Judgment Day. On Judgment Day, if you did try that, he would say, oh, well, let me show you the Lord Jesus. He never did a thing wrong to anybody, even after they did what they did to him. Did you live up to that? <laughs> yeah, when, when Jesus Christ is your example, don't bother giving an explanation. <laughs> Dr. Ruckman taught us real well. He said, just say on Judgment Day, yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. <laughs> You will not win the argument with that judge, I assure you. Amen. And the one that knows every thought you ever thought and every feeling you ever had and every moment you, motive you ever had and every word you ever spoke, no, you're not, you are not going to win an argument with him. Fear the Lord. But now I'm talking to Bible being the Baptist. You wouldn't shoot somebody unless it was, you know, bona fide self-defense. You wouldn't cuss somebody, I trust. <laughs> you wouldn't cheat, steal, commit adultery. You wouldn't do these wrong things for the most
most part. Believe me, if you've been in Baptist churches as long as I have, you know some exceptions to that. But, for the most part, you wouldn't. But I'll tell you what a lot of Baptists do. You have a real bad spirit. Amen. Here's the problem with Judgment Day. You might, and I'm ashamed to say I did this some, you might have your verses all ready to defend how right your position is. God Almighty, as I've already pointed out, the Lord Jesus talking to his disciples, not only pointed out whether or not their deeds and their words were right, but how right their spirit was. Bible-believing Baptists don't always get that one right, even when they get, you know, they don't break the Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know why you should treat your family the way you do? Because you fear God seeing things you do and the spirit you have as you do them. Ah, we should have learned that. We should have learned that years ago, shouldn't we? Verse 5, the Lord bless thee. The Lord shall bless thee out of Zion. And thou shalt see the good of Jerusalem all the days of thy life. Notice happy and blessing and well and all these wonderful things. And that's the Lord. And that's your labor. And that's your loves. Look at verse 6 and see one more. Yea, thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. That's a fairly long life, isn't it? Amen. So if, you are, if you're following with the hills, with the alliteration I'm doing here, you've got the Lord, you've got your labor, you've got your love, you've got long life. Or maybe you could say it this way, here's your legacy. You know what the Lord says about Israel when they uh, quit living for him and get in trouble? He says, Oh, that they were wise, that they would consider their latter end. Live your life in a way that you will be proud of it on your deathbed. Amen. Think about the legacy that you are leaving. Don't do what feels good today. And even when you slip up and do, make it right quickly. And don't leave a long standing pattern of it. That's why I warn, if you're angry, and you say some things that you know you won't always feel that way, don't put it in writing. For somebody to have a card in 25 years from now, remember where you said that, or more applicable today, don't put it on the internet. Whose glory is in their shame, the Bible says in the last times. Amen. You know what? There are some things you're going to be ashamed of. You don't want a lasting legacy of that. You don't want to have to live that down in a long life. The Lord, your labor, your loves, your legacy. Think of what is lasting. Think of what the long view is. That's your work. Psalm 127 was your worry. Psalm 128 is your work. Now let's look at Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27, begin reading verse 23. Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks, and look well to thy herds. For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation. The hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth itself, and the herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lambs are for thy clothing, and the goats are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food, for the food of thy household, and for the maintenance for thy maidens. I call this paying attention. The stuff God's blessed you with, and here at Victory Baptist Church, he's blessed you with some things. Amen. We have some things. We have some things to be thankful for. You know what he says? He says, be diligent to know the state of thy flocks. You know what he says? He says, look well to thy herds. Papa used to tell me, if you don't take care of what you got, you'll never have nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not only work and be bringing in income, but the stuff you have, <coughs> take care of it. And lo and behold, it'll build up your financial wealth, but it'll also build up the heritage and the training of children and those that are coming behind you. I won't do the best with this one. I don't. Here's the problem with teaching and preaching the Bible. You're going to come across your own weaknesses regularly. Oh, yeah. You are, man. I may as well tell you. 
But be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. Look well to thy herds. Chapter 24 and verse 32, I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that traveleth and thy want as an armed man. Don't be one of these people that goes and works eight, nine, ten hours and then comes home and crashes. There's some stuff to take care of at home. Oh, yeah. There's a field to be taken care of. There's crops to be taken care of. There's animals to be taken care of. There's laundry clothes and dishes. There's um, stuff that needs to be cleaned, maintained, taken care of. You say, oh, I'm a hard worker. I work 10 hours a day, five days a week. Yeah, what do you do when you get home? This is going to be a real short point. <laughs> We're not going to talk about this for real. You know what you need to do? You need to pay attention. When I don't take care of things, you know why? I just don't even see them. They've been sitting there so long, I just keep walking by them. <laughs> Some things I meant to do in one day, next thing I know, it's been one month. <laughs> and there it still sits. I just got used to walking by it. It's not, this is not my strength, I'll just tell you. But it'll sure help you if you'll follow Papa's advice and you'll take care of what you got. <laughs> Pay you know what it says to, to the husband? Dwell with them according to knowledge. <coughs> For example, your wife. Notice now, is she happy? Is there something that's being neglected there? Am I listening? Am I paying attention? Sometimes listening isn't the right word to say to a man. Because you know what we can do? We can have the ball game on and kind of half listen. <laughs> we can be changing the plugs and the oil and this and that and kind of half listen. You know what we're not doing? We're not paying attention. We're not seeing the facial expressions. We're not noticing the tone of voice. We're not seeing the body language. We're not getting the whole picture. And if they said, you're not listening, we'd say yes and just repeat right back what was said to us. But we're not paying attention. You know what it says? It says, diligent to know the state of thy flocks. You know what it says? It says, look well to thy herds. Women can do it too. I'm, I'm, I admit I'm, de I'm preaching the Proverbs, so I'm addressing it primarily to young men, but there's something we can all learn from it, isn't there? Pay attention. Uh, similarly, um, Proverbs 27, verses 23 to 27, the hay appeareth, and the grass showeth itself. You know what will happen when you get home? If you actually look for a minute, there will be stuff you see that needs done. Kent Hovind had a great message on this that he used to preach to kids in Christian schools all the time, talking about the three kinds of workers. A number one worker is the one that goes in and sees what needs to be done and does it. A number two worker is somebody that goes in and waits for the boss to tell him to do something, and then he goes and does it. And that's pretty good. That's better than some. But they have no idea what needs to be done. They don't notice that the hay appeareth. They don't know that, notice that the tender grass showeth itself. That's a number two worker. You just have to wait for the boss to tell them. A number three worker, when the boss needs something, they don't even know where the guy is. <laughs> and you're never going to get anywhere with a number three worker. Number two worker, you can keep the business going. A number one worker, they can write their own check. You know why? Because wherever a work needs to be done, wherever a job needs to be done, wherever the business needs to be grown, they see it and they make it happen. There is no there is no amount of money that you can put on that. They see something needs to be sold, they figure out a way to sell it. You don't. They do not have to wait for the boss to come and tell them. Why? Because the hay appeareth, the tender grass showeth itself, and then the lambs you've already got, there's your clothing. And the goat's milk, there's your food, and there's the food for your household, and it'll also maintain thy maidens. <laughs> All right, so we've seen worry in Psalm 127. We've seen work in Psalm 128. We've seen work in Proverbs 27 and uh, Proverbs chapter 24 and paying attention. Now, I know what you're going to say. You're going to say, wait a minute, brother. We're in the end times now. All this family stuff you're talking about, the feminist movement has come along men are emasculated and women don't have any respect and they're not going to follow their leader. And now we've got the manosphere and it hates the women and says all the women are dead wrong and the children are told not to obey their parents and they can tell people at the school, you know, under the government school system stuff, they don't even tell their parents. 
The whole thing is coming apart. Our society is falling. None of the old rules apply anymore. What do you do now? Thankfully, that very situation happens in the Bible. Let's turn and see what God says to do when it happens. All right, turn to Jeremiah chapter 29. Jeremiah 29. All right, now if you remember the prophetic, uh, the prophets in the, in the Old Testament talking about how God's going to punish Israel, he, he says, now the men aren't doing right, so you know women are going to rule over them and children are going to be their oppressors and all this judgment's going to happen and instead of worshiping the one true God, they've been unfaithful, so I'm going to have Babylon come and I'm going to take them over and they're going to be carried away captive to Babylon. Now how many will agree that's pretty close to a worst case scenario? <laughs> that's about as bad as it gets. So apparently there's a whole new set of rules. we got to change everything when we lose our freedoms and we lose our country and we lose our uh, family structure and we lose all the things that are good and right and godly that God teaches. What do you do when the whole society falls apart? Well, here, here they find themselves in that very situation in Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29, verse 4. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, unto all that are carried away captives, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem unto Babylon. You know, God's the one that sends a bunch of these judgments. That's true. But that's another sermon. Verse 5. Build ye houses, and dwell in them, and plant gardens, and eat the fruit of them. Take ye wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, that ye may be increased there and not diminished, and seek the peace of the city, whither I have caused you to be carried away captives, and pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. In the worst case scenario, he tells them to basically do what he's already told them to do back in Psalms and Proverbs. I don't care how bad it gets. You know what you need to be, be doing until the Lord raptures us out of here? Build your house, take your wife, have your children, bring up good grandchildren for God Almighty, pray for the peace of the city that you're living in, be the best citizen you can be, and just keep doing right, even if you find yourself in pagan Babylon, and we're just about there, aren't we? Amen. Here's what you do. Keep doing right. Amen. And God gives peace and honor and blessing. I admit, there are extreme cases. There was, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah getting fire and brimstone rain down on it, and there was some things in the apocalyptic scriptures where there was awful uh, scorpions coming and stinging people, and you can't exactly live a very normal life when some of those real, real, real extreme cases go. But even when it gets real bad and your society crumbles, just keep doing right. Amen. Keep what some of the psychologists call that masculine frame, staying in control, staying doing what God told you to do. Keep the Lord first. Keep your labor second. Keep your loves third. And the whole time, remember the legacy you're leaving. And 70 years later, God got them back. That's right. But you know what they were supposed to be doing in the meantime? Build their houses, plant their gardens, eat the fruit of their hands. You know what the Bible says? It talks about the gifts of God. And it says to enjoy the fruit of your labor is the gift of God. Amen. I don't care if you're in Jerusalem during a revival or in Babylon during the captivity. Your gift from God is to love him, work hard, raise your family, leave a godly labor. That is the gift of God. Yes, it is. That's what you should have been doing 200 years ago in this country when we were going through the separate Baptist revival, and that's what you should be doing right now when I believe we're just about at the end times. Me too. You know what you do? You stay steady, and you keep doing right, and you look to God for blessing. Now, does that mean, you know, there's peace on earth coming in the next few years? Probably not. <laughs> does that mean we're about to have a big revival in this country? Probably not. Does that mean things are just going to get better and better when we're $30 trillion in debt and most marriages are ending in divorce and people are fighting one another and there's more and more blood in our streets and more and more economic uncertainty? Probably not. But you know what you and your little group can do? You can have blessing and peace 
as long as you put the Lord first, your labor second, your loves, and you worry about what legacy you're leaving behind you. All right.